Have you ever wondered how social media affects you? And how can you do better with who you follow? That's what we're going to talk about today. Twitter is a great place to tell the world what you're thinking before you've had a chance to think about it. Chris Perillo. Today we're going to talk about the book, Who Are You Following? Pursuing Jesus in a Social Media Obsessed World by Sadie Robertson Huff. She's one of the Robertson family, the daughter of Willie Robertson, and she's a good egg. I remember her telling her grandfather, Al, when he said, why are you looking at your phone all the time? Shouldn't you be telling people about Jesus? And she looks down at her phone, she does a bit of typing, and she says, there, I just told 5 million people about Jesus. She understood right away the power, but later learned the peril of social media. And now in this book that she wrote, she's trying to find that good balance, not to leave social media necessarily, but to use it in a proper way when we're trying to follow Jesus. She admits that, Social media has an impact on us all, and that those who are millennials, born from 1981 to 1996, were probably the first to be greatly impacted by social media. I know when I think about it, I think about the fact that when I had school, and I had bullies or people who made fun of me, you know, at the end of the day, I went home, and I hung out with my parents, or I hung out with my friends, and that was the end of it. Okay. School tomorrow, let's brace and get ready for the new school day and see what that will bring. But kids after social media came out, they are hit with everything all day long, all night long, when they're in bed looking at their phones. Whatever happens in school, whether it be happy or bullying or something else, it's happening to them 24 hours a day. It's not something I had to grow up with. And for my part in social media, I'm not a big fan of it. One thing I love about it is I've never been able to keep track of friends of mine from my past. I grew up on a military base. We moved around a lot. And if we didn't move, my friends moved. So your friendships were very short-lived and you never got to see people again. Now I'm in contact with people I grew up with on the military base. I never imagined I would talk to again. And my friends from high school. I'm not really much of a correspondence person, to be honest with you, so I always lost track of everyone. But to that extent, social media has been great. Then I've been learning how to love it better because when you have a podcast, one of the best ways that you can promote your podcast, get people involved in your podcast, is through social media. So I've been thinking long and hard about how I want to do that. And if you don't know, currently I'm using Twitter. I am also have the podcast on YouTube. I'm thinking about some short videos to augment both podcasts and the third one that's coming and wondering if Instagram might not be the next best place for me. I'm not sure. I'd love to know where you hang out in social media, so you make sure that you email me and let me know. She says that she knows people who spend up to six hours a day on social media and how that just affects everything. And at the writing of this book, she says there's 8 million videos live on Facebook, 10 billion on Snapchat, and that 1,074 photos are uploaded to Instagram every second. And we know that it affects people. I think it affects me less because I grew up without it, and so I sort of got my bearing before I got hit by it. And 90% of teens say that they have been harassed. I remember reading that study that said Instagram makes girls want to have eating disorders and then shows them videos and images of how to act on it. Someone even said the horrifying thing that you can go to TikTok and within eight videos get to teen suicide. Not like don't do suicide, but do it. It's really frightening stuff. And hopefully we get a grip on the algorithm. We understand what we're being hit with. And then we're understanding what our kids are being hit with. And so she asked the question is, who's influencing you right now? If you have been talked into buying something, if you wondered if these pants are flattering to you after you watched a video, you're being influenced. And influence isn't necessarily bad, but to ignore the fact that you're being influenced could be potentially dangerous if you don't understand that's what's really happening. 
And you have to realize that the goal of every social media is to keep you on the service. As I'm trying to navigate this for the podcast itself, if you include a link to something outside the service you're doing with social media, many times your post will get downgraded. They want you to stay on the site. They don't want you going to my website. They don't want you going to YouTube. They want you to stay right where you're at. So it is becoming a cutthroat business. We can see it in the news when it comes to Reddit and other social media groups that have been trying to keep people right where they're at. These algorithms, these people who run the social media, they're trying to figure out what makes people stay, what sticks with people, and how to keep them right where they're at. And that's why they're so invested in the algorithm. You know, for Facebook or for other things, I just want to follow a number of people and then have you show me those number of people. I don't want things that are promoted. I don't want you to make up something for me. I want to see my friends. I want to see people I'm interested in. But you know what? Social media doesn't make money in showing you what you want to see. They make money by showing you what they think you want to see or more money. So you have to realize the old adage that if something is free, you're what's for sale, not a product. And that's the case of most social media. And she says in general, you know, people follow people on social media and she talks about that. But when we call it following, isn't that a word that should mean something to us? We're not just interested in what a person says on Twitter or Facebook or something, we are following them. It's bothersome to Christianity, I think, in particular, because we're supposed to be following Jesus. And now we're following the latest star. It's really hard to put those two in reconciled positions. Jesus is who we follow. And she says in the end, it's not wrong to look at entertainment and admit that social media is entertainment. But if we give it a bigger meaning in our life, that's where it could go really wrong. One of the podcasts we're going to be talking about is not so much when you do something, is it bad that I'm doing this thing, but is it taking up my time that I could be doing something else? There's two questions anytime you spend time doing something. And then she says that we should ask ourselves, who should I follow? If we're getting influenced, if we're being influenced by people we don't know who might not even have our best interest at heart. It can be damaging to us. And in cases, social media, she says, is not always bad influence. Maybe you watched a sermon. I tend to follow a lot of pastors online. I get a lot of interesting viewpoints and very biblical ones because I'm very careful about who I follow. I hope that it has a good effect on me, but you have to realize For good or bad, we are following somebody. Heck, I've even met friends who got married online by meeting people in games and other places. So it can be very impactful on our lives for good or bad. But she said that there's a lot of people who don't have a lot of guidance from parents, from family, who don't help them out with that, who don't have a stable place where they can talk to someone reasonable about what they're seeing online. A lot of times, kids in particular, just internalize it. She compares it to when she first got her license. And I remember when I first got my license, I was given a car and it was a terrible car. It didn't go in reverse and it had a lot of problems. The good news of it is it was before cars had computers. That's how old this car was. So everything was mechanical. So when something broke, I knew pretty well how to fix it. But as soon as I got my driver's license, I was off like a shot. I was driving hours away with my friends to attend parties with their family and relatives and other friends that they had in other towns. But what if something happened? What if I got in trouble? What if I got robbed? This town was a little bit more dangerous than the town I lived in. Or my terrible car, what if it broke down in the wrong place? It's a lot of possibilities of danger. This is where she's saying that social media is a lot like this. As soon as we get on social media, we're 100% confident how awesome we are. As I was 100% confident that my car was awesome and I'm an awesome driver, nothing's going to happen. And that false sense of awesomeness can be very damaging to us. And so she says in the end, whether it's family or friends, whether it's teachers or it's social media, you are being influenced. But 
the point of it is, is we have to remember, first and foremost, that we are followers of Jesus. He should be our number one influencer. He said specifically, follow me. Told Matthew that. He told Peter that. He wanted people to follow him. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Follow him. And we know, too, where he's leading. He is leading us to heaven. He's leading us to eternal life. He's leading us to the life that God intended for us when he created us. It's not changing. It's not shifting. It's not cruel, which social media a lot of times can be. This message that we get from Jesus, she says, is countercultural. And he was countercultural at the time. It was something that people had never seen before. But we were created in God's image. God is love. He loves us. He's desperately interested in what is going on in our lives. I love that Bible passage. It was at a friend of mine's wedding. We love because God loved us first. She says it can feel like a dark question, but 100% of us will die. And so when we look at where we're going to have eternal life with Jesus in heaven, it's so important that we take that topic seriously. And that's where Jesus is leading us, to heaven, to eternal life, and again, to the life that he wants us to live. But social media, what what are they leading us towards? She said that she wants to make sure that she takes time, not just investigating social media, but finding out what Jesus wants from us. And that we hope that the Spirit will guide us every day and every night so that we know the right path. I always think about that passage where it says that Jesus is a lamp unto our feet. Isn't that weird? When we see lamps, they're over our head. They're high up. You know, they're maybe attached to sides of buildings. But a lamp unto our feet means this path and journey that we're on together, small steps, Jesus is lighting up that path. We're not meant to stand in a single corner or outside our building, but we're walking, we're moving And that path is lit for us by Jesus. And she said that in the end, social media has so many confusing messages. How can we tell which messages are the right messages for us? She said that Galatians 5, 22, 23 says it all. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And that's how we know if we're following the Spirit. Do you think that social media gives any of those things to us often? We get a chuckle. We get a laugh. Maybe we see something that someone did and we get angry about it. But those things mentioned in Galatians, not often what we get out of social media. And if we're not getting that from social media, and that's the fruit that it's bearing— We have to really question whether the Spirit wants us to be down this path at all. She says that Jesus tells us good trees produce good fruits. And if we're not seeing good fruits, that's our clue about whether or not we're going down the right way. She says it's important that we know what we're seeking, what we're looking for. You know, obviously the internet's full of all sorts of things. We can find maps, we can get locations, we can find a good restaurant. You know, we know that when we look for something on the internet, for the most part, we'll find the answer to it. When it comes to literal questions of where can I buy a stove in my town or how do I find a place to get a dog, the internet's great for that. But then when there's a whole bunch of different clicks in there, we're not really sure what we're going to get. And we may end up unintendedly seeing things we don't want to see. I remember I looked up an exercise dude, and his book. And somehow, because I spelled his name wrong, I ended up with bad things. Just because you're looking for something doesn't mean you're going to get what you're looking for. She points out that the disciples in general knew Jesus when they saw him. They knew that he was the Lord. And she said, quote, they stopped scrolling and dropped everything. It's weird because I watched again The Chosen and I would see that where these people were fishing or Matthew was in his booth and Jesus would come up and say, follow me. And they'd walk right out and follow him. Why would they do that? I mean, we know they did that because that's what the Bible told us they did. But would I do that if someone came to me and said that? And the reason is, is because they were Jewish. They knew the prophecies. 
They knew what they were expecting. And that message got passed down generation after generation because it was the most important message. Look for the Messiah. And people got screwed up too. People thought the Messiah was going to beat back the Romans. They thought the Messiah was going to vanquish all the enemies on earth. I mean, they all had their images of what the Messiah was. But the people who were looking for the Messiah and knew what it is that the Messiah would be, they knew that Jesus was it. And they stopped looking and started just following. They know it from the very beginning where John was standing with two of the disciples. He looked at Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this and followed Jesus. They knew what they were looking for. And we know what we're looking for. We found the Messiah too. We know that Jesus was the Messiah. So what is it too that we're looking for when we go to social media? And so she says in the end, we have to be more intentional about what it is we're looking for. When we go out on the internet, I know I do it too. Sometimes I'm just doing it because I'm bored or I'm not really sure what I'm looking for or I'm just looking for a topic to do in the podcast. But Sometimes, again, when we aren't looking for something particular, we're not having our eyes focused on Jesus, we find something else. And that, in general, she says, Matthew 6, we should seek first the kingdom of God. And that word is first. That doesn't mean at the end of the day, we'll seek the kingdom of God, or on Sunday, we'll seek the kingdom of God. Seek first. She mentions something called the seven times factor. And it came from that movie from Netflix, The Social Dilemma. That is such an amazing, eye-opening movie if you haven't seen it. It's worth taking a look at. Because what you see in it is how this media is trying to keep us glued to what they're seeing. Even if maybe what we're seeing isn't particularly good for us. I remember way back before social media came out, there was this interesting article that I believe ABC News did, that found out that the food companies were trying to destroy Europe's look at eating lightly. They would eat chips, maybe, but they would just have a couple of them and be done with it because there was such a stigma around being overweight, particularly in France. And so the food executives were trying to figure out how can we break France of this desire to be thin? this desire not to eat a lot of junk food. And that's what they were trying to compete. And they basically decided they were going to start putting billboards up that had heavier people. They were going to start disintegrating something that was clearly very good for Europe and very good for France, that people wanted to be thin, healthy, and put snack foods in their proper place. And that's what the movie Social Dilemma did for a different topic. It tries to figure out how can we get you to stay? How can we stop you from leaving? And the seven times factor is if we see an ad seven times, that's what will encourage us to make a purchase. The more times we see a product, the more likely we're going to buy it. And so that's what they tried to do is to make sure we get that trigger in enough dose so we do what it is they're wanting to see. So my challenge to you is take a look at the social media you look at and the kind of people that you follow. Are they the people that you should be allowing to have influence in your life? Should they be the people that you should be talking to and debating with and hanging out with so you can see how you can learn better together? Or is it someone leading you down a bad path? Think about trimming either your social media, your entertainment diet, or people that you follow to see if you can't do better with the life you're trying to give. Then try to think about who you want to be on the internet and what can you do to be an influencer of the right things. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. I hope that this was helpful to you. And remember, our path through social media and following the right way starts with small steps.